Uh, but our candidate obviously takes us beyond the standard biracial framework for understanding American politics. Professor Vargas has demonstrated in his scholarship that 20th century civil rights scholarship must include the struggles of Mexican-American and Latino workers. The great intellectual activist, Ernesto Galarza, and I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but sometimes he's referred to in Chicano scholarship as the Chicano W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Um, he was an activist like Du Bois, a great scholar. Uh, he said many years ago, I think he said this in the 30s, as percentages of poor, brown and black, hold about equal shares of not having. And that statement is equally true today. I don't know how many of you followed the recent wealth, color wealth conference, and it turns out that African Americans and Latinos have about 15% per capita aggregate wealth that white Americans have. And there's really not that much difference between blacks and Latinos. 15%. And that's a historical legacy that didn't just come about yesterday. Vargas's work, oh, and also the other thing is uh, it's widely one of the things about racism today, we have to remember, is that economic racism is still kind of accepted. It's widely accepted, for example, and I've done research on this, looking at, at some uh, EEOC statistics and cases, it's still widely acceptable in the U.S. to pay black and brown workers lesser salaries than their white counterparts, regardless of their educational attainment. And that's in the mainstream economic literature. Vargas's work joins out of scholars such as Carlos Munoz, Latita Martinez, Roxanne Dunmore Ortiz, Peter Kwong, and others, who remind us that the civil rights movement writ large was never simply a story of black and white. My question to him is how does his work change the way we think about civil rights? Is this simply a matter of adding more protagonists to the story, or does Professor Vargas seek to make a broader statement about the 20th century freedom movement broadly understood? And we're talking about memories this weekend. I was thinking about my father, who was a Hispanic EEOC, uh, Equal Employment o Opportunity Commission uh, officer at the Beach of San Diego Shipyard in Burlington, Washington. And I don't have time to tell this whole story, but my dad was a bit too old to join the Chicano movement. And uh, he was never in college. But he was a member of the NAACP and a very strong supporter of the United Farm Workers. And he, um, he worked in the shipyard in Burlington, Washington for many years. He was a union member, like my grandfather. Um, he loved his job, he loved swapping stories, he was a great storyteller. Um, he defines his, his EEOC work in the 70s and the 80s, during the Reagan era, really as a civil rights activity. And what he was trying to do was he was trying to help Hispanics get into supervisory positions in the shipyard. They've been shut out of those positions. And with apologies to William Julius Wilson, my father was doing this during the era of, quote, declining significance of race. Um, we never experienced that. Uh, that was a, a joke. Um, my, family's memory, my family's memories of dad's EOC work are, are still quite strong. We still remember the day when the first group of, of significant group of, of Hispanics were promoted to supervisor, supervisor positions in the yard. But we remember this not really as a day of triumph, but really one of, of, it was a mixed um, emotion. Because this was also the day that my father lost all of his white friends. Uh, and they just turned their backs on him. He had worked with them for 20 years. Uh, they accused him, quote, of letting the wetbacks take over the shipyard. And it was really painful for the entire family. Uh, and it's, it's a memory we continue to live with to this day. Now, in revealing the hidden history of the March on Washington, Will Jones pushes us to take ideology and radicalism seriously. The men and women who organized the March on Washington are not just, quote, activists. Many of them were socialists and even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Jones's work also goes against the current of scholarship that too often frames activism in politically neutral language. Now, most of the activists I think that we worked with or researched had some kind of ideology, right, that kind of animated their work. And so my question for Will is, what happened to the socialism of Randolph uh, with District 65 activists over time? Did it continue to echo in the black freedom movement? If so, where and in what spaces? Now, for example, I'm thinking of that great moment in 1971 when C.L.R. James delivers three, three lectures at the Institute of the Black World uh, on three topics. The Haitian Revolution, Du Bois' black reconstruction, and uh, a reassessment of his own work with black jackets. And years later, one of the first book talks I gave around for Emancipation of Trade was at the No Bookstore in Durham. And the first three questions were questions asked to me by three self-defined African-American socialists. 
And so what happens to that, to that over time? Does it just simply disappear? And finally, I want to get Professor Vargas and Dr. Jones talking to each other. In labor rights or civil rights, Dr. Vargas writes, quote, radical views like anarchism, socialism, and communism were familiar to the progressive elements in the Mexican community by the turn of the 20th century. What I like about your formulation here is that you go on to acknowledge that many of these radi uh, radicals were simultaneously, simultaneously nationalists uh, of various stripes. And if possible, I'd like you to compare and contrast the ways that nationalist politics coexisted with these other strains of radical thoughts among black and Latino workers. And this may be a bit too nebulous of a question, but the main point is to keep all talking to, to each other. So um, thank you, and I'll just see you for that.